Hi, I'm Rachel. It's the 4th of July 2019 as I'm filming this, so I'm at uh, home rather than at work. Uh, and I'm about to start my small collection of short story related July videos. Namely, I am reading and reviewing a couple of stories in this hefty collection, The Best American Short Stories of the Century, as uh, curated by John Updike. I've been reading about seven a year for the last couple of years, slowly making my way through this collection. I used to tap this onto another short story video, but those videos were getting pretty long, so I decided this year I would do them separately. So the first story I read uh, today is The Resurrection of a Life by William Soroyan, and I'm starting on kind of a down note. I don't know, maybe this makes me sound uncultured, but what I got out of this story was this was a cynical asshole looking bitterly back at his life. <laughs> and particularly, you know, uh, stopping around the World War I t uh, category, which of course was incredibly brutal and horrifying. Uh, but I just was not in love with uh, the way that he attacked this story. Uh, and I think there must be much better World War I fiction out there. So, next! Look, Missy joined me too as I'm discussing the second story, Christmas Gift by Robert Penn Warren. I like this one a fair bit better. It was a very descriptive story. It really set the scene of, uh, seems like, uh, 19th century frontier land and this uh, young boy comes into town from out of town, uh, I mean, living on the outskirts of town, to go find a doctor. And, like, first he goes into a store and it's, like, cold uh, winter and he's around a stove with a bunch of men and you get to hear about his family, that, you know, he's uh, a bastard and that he lives with his father and mother, like, you know, out in the woods, basically, and one of his sisters is pregnant and he needs a doctor. And so we just uh, go with him on the journey to find the doctor and then to take the doctor back to his house. And we just sort of hear about the rough tumble family of uh, his life, basically, while uh, also reading about the slush and the cold and uh, the wagon and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, just a very small slice of life, but it definitely worked better for me. This is a much longer and much bleaker story coming up next. It's uh, Bright and Morning Star by Richard Wright. We're in the South and our main character is uh, this elderly black woman named Sue. And her two sons are involved in uh, the communist movement, basically. They're trying to rustle up support from uh, other black people and other white people. There's an interesting uh, intersectionality, sort of, in this story, uh, what we might call it today, uh, kind of. It really um, focuses much more on, on the black characters and on uh, the violent racism that uh, just followed them wherever they went. Uh, Sue's has two sons, one of them is already in jail, and the second one is uh, rallying up support, but uh, the sheriff and, you know, lawmen are on their tail to try to, uh, you know, squelch out the, the communist movement, but of course there's also this racist uh, component uh, involved about how things went down in the Jim Crow era. It's just very brutal <laughs> and uh, kind of sad, but at the same time, uh, Wright, of course, is writing about resistance and uh, the small way in which uh, uh, Sue is able to rustle up herself to, to resist this horribleness and this violence. And uh, it's one of those stories basically about uh, how to survive and to define yourself with, you know, these forces that are just so, you know, against you. <laughs> I mean, to say it in the mildest terms possible, but uh, yeah, this one was a sucker punch. Next I have The Hitchhikers by Eudora Weltley, and I'm back to a slice of life kind of story. We're following this man, a traveling salesman who, on his way to a certain town, finds some hitchhikers by the side of the road, but once he takes them into his car, he realizes they're more of tramps, you know, the homeless sort of wandering type of people, not really going anywhere. And anyway, they have some time in the car where you kind of get to know a little bit about them, like their personality types, and then he arrives to his hotel and tries to get them a place to sleep on the porch, and uh, there's a violent altercation in his car, basically, where one of them, you know, severely hurts the other one. And we're mostly with this traveling salesman, and it seems like the M.O. Wel uh, Welty is going for is uh, that all this stuff happens around him, but not to him. Like, this altercation that, you know, happens in his car isn't really about him particularly. And meanwhile, he goes to this party in town where people know him and he kind of sort of remembers them. Uh, he remembers some, but not others. And it's that whole thing again, I guess, because, you know, he's a traveling salesman. So this isn't really his home and he only comes through occasionally. And I guess in a way, 
it's similar to being a tramp or a hitchhiker in that he's a wanderer, even if he has more purpose. Uh, so it, it was an interesting set of circumstances. <laughs> this is The Peach Stone by Paul Horgan. This is a stream of consciousness story about a family that's driving to a town to bury their young daughter who was killed in an accident. Uh, and it's uh, basically to completely inside of all of their heads. There are four people in the car, the two parents, their young son, and his teacher. And we're just sort of in their personal thoughts as they're dealing with grief and anger and, and what have you. I think when I was younger, I liked the idea of stream of consciousness more, or I wanted it to work, but for the most part, I, I don't know. I, I suppose the whole point of it was disjointedness, but it didn't give me much to latch onto. Mostly I was wondering, why the hell is the teacher even there <laughs> with them in the car? And at the end, when there's finally some dialogue, it seems like maybe she's there to be a witness to uh, the funeral, or possibly it's uh, the author's way of trying to uh, <laughs> look into the fact that she sees them as united in their grief when really they aren't. <laughs> you know, they're all in their separate thoughts. Until the very end at the funeral when uh, it seems like emotions come together for something. I don't know, it just seemed a little too circumscribed for me. <laughs> I guess I'm just uh, less taken with the, the stream of consciousness uh, uniting these people. <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting idea. Next I have That in Aleppo Once by Vladimir Nobokov. And uh, this is another very short, more stylish piece uh, than I would like. Uh, it's epistolary. It's our first World War II story. Our narrator, uh, upon arriving uh, to the U.S. from uh, war-torn Europe, uh, is writing to a V, uh, and the letter largely has to do with the disillusion of his marriage to his wife along the way. Or maybe there was no marriage. Maybe the wife is an illusion for his unhappiness, and there's lots of... Uh, lyrical language and callbacks to other literature and sources and uh, you know it makes me feel uneducated but I just didn't connect to it. <laughs> I like longer more graspable stories perhaps. And finally I have The Interior Castle by Jean Stafford. This is a story about a woman who was in a car crash and uh, it takes place when she's in the hospital recuperating and I think it's an interesting look on uh, this sort of uh, event. There's something really surreal about it, like uh, the way that uh, she is sort of uh, regressing into herself to privately deal with uh, what's going on, and uh, the uh, hospital staff are, are just completely unnerved by her, and uh, the way that they're saying you should be grateful because the other guy died, I don't know, there's something so macabre about it. And meanwhile, her own thoughts, especially when she's going through a nose surgery to uh, her, her nose had been ruined. Uh, there's something uh, so surreal about them, about how she's uh, dealing uh, with the, the pain, and the, there's such intricate uh, surgery going on, and it's just like such an unusual look into an unusual life, as it were. There was something very matter-of-fact about how she talked about some of her injuries, like her broken teeth, but then she also talked a bit about the different types of pain, like her uh, frustration with her surgeon, but also the pain that would come over her body sometimes. And I actually had a friend who was in a, in a bad car accident recently, and she talked about, you know, the, this pain and nausea that she has to deal with all the time. Uh, she, the character in the book also, you know, had a skull fracture from the accident. So it's just a reminder of... Uh, how things can change so much, I guess, due to this accident and what that looks like. And uh, it's just a unique story, so I will give it that. But ultimately, I think I have to go with the Richard Wright story. I mean, as my favorite, just because it had the most emotional clout to it and certainly uh, talked about very uh, important uh, sociological issues about uh, America's past. So that about covers it for me now. I will leave information about the stories and the authors and uh, the literary magazines where they were first published uh, down below and uh, the years they were published. Uh, meanwhile, I hope to have this uh, edited and posted uh, before the festivities tonight, although I'll be staying in. I actually, I live in the D.C. area and I went to the uh, rehearsal for the Capital Fourth event that will be airing on PBS tonight uh, and that was a whole lot of fun. Uh, it might storm tonight, maybe, and uh, my dad and I were wondering maybe they'll be, you know, just airing the rehearsal tonight if that's the case. I guess we'll have to see, although I guess I'm really hoping uh, that uh, the weather stays okay. At least it looks nice outside the window right now. <laughs>
So happy Independence Day to everyone celebrating. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.